Did you know that psychodynamic therapies are evidence-based treatments? While most research participants in psychodynamic therapies are white, the therapy itself may resonate with therapists and clients of color who appreciate deep relational interactions. For therapists who choose to utilize this treatment, what might a culturally responsive approach look like in psychodynamic therapy? Welcome to People of Color in Psychology, the show that explores mental health topics specific to culture, diversity, and communities of color. I am your host, Jack Zen. Our guest today, we have Dr. Geneva Renaga Apico. She is the founder and executive director of Borderlands Therapy Collaborative, which is a group practice focused on working with people who have been pushed to the margins of society. She personally provides consultation, supervision, and psychotherapy focusing on relational trauma in BIPOC and LGBTQ plus populations. She takes a race-conscious, decolonial, anti-sexist, trauma-informed, sex-positive, and poly- and kink-friendly approach to her treatment. Dr. Geneva worked for 18 years before starting her own practice. She started out in neuropsychological assessments in hospital settings, then worked for 16 years in university counseling centers, mostly as a director, but also as a training director and clinical director. She also taught at the graduate and undergraduate levels in the areas of multiculturalism and psychological assessment. She has served on advisory boards, editorial boards, and published several articles and book chapters focused on Latinx psychology. As part of our Hispanic Heritage series, Dr. Geneva, a queer Latinx licensed psychologist, will be discussing her intersectional mujerista perspective in working with people of color, that it's about intersubjectivity and intersectionality, that we can be human in this work even though systems aren't set up for us to be human. Dr. Geneva, Thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Can you share with me your journey in getting into this work and provide any memorable events that happened? Yeah, it's such a gigantic question, right? I really always have been interested in knowing everything. (laughs) And I, I genuinely mean it that way because I've just always been very curious. And as a young person, really found refuge in books. School, fortunately, came very easily to me uh, throughout life and was a place where I could feel seen, where I could feel known and also start to know about things. So my teachers were really great about letting me read random stuff that I could get a hold of. And I really appreciate that kind of support because I definitely didn't have that in other spaces. I was a first generation college student, definitely first one to get a graduate degree in my family and and all that kind of stuff. So I honestly thought that I could know everything uh, when I was a teenager. And so I thought, oh, well, who knows everything? Doctors know everything. So let me be a doctor. I only knew of medical doctors back then. So I thought, okay, I'm smart and I want to know everything. I'll become a medical doctor. Got to college, was pre-med and very much hated it pretty much from the beginning. Had no idea what I was doing or anything about college or anything like that. And somehow I think like stumbled backwards into psychology. And I went to a very research intensive undergraduate campus. Again, unbeknownst to me, I I didn't know what any of that kind of stuff meant. And so psych was super boring at that sort of place, right? All research methods and very different than clinical work, but it was still so much fun for me compared to what I had been doing as a pre-med student. And so fell in love with psych, changed my major, and then never sort of stopped wanting to be a doctor. Although the more I learned, the more I realized that it was never going to be possible to know everything and that that was actually kind of an arrogant goal. But my curiosity and thirst for knowledge uh, really stayed. So I think the reason that psych has always been perfect for me is that it's a gigantic field. And when we're working with people or when we're interested in knowing things about people, I really feel like the more we think we know, the more we really realize we don't know. When we try to study the brain, for example, when we try to study human interactions, when we try to predict things about people, 
we're always surprised and I find that really humbling. So yes, I wanna help people and yes, I'm really interested in you know, being a source of some version of something positive in the world. And I've always felt that way, but I think for me, psych really holds me because I get to be curious all day long and learn new stuff all day long. Whether I work as an administrator, whether I work as a clinician or an instructor, and for me, psych is really perfect. Uh, you have a very, I would say, you have a specialized approach to your treatment. Rarely do we talk about, you know, like a race conscious approach, a decolonial stance, kink and poly friendly approach with the marginalized groups. And I'm wondering how did your journey may have informed or shaped that direction? Yeah. You know, before I knew what any of these words were, it's always been really clear to me that I don't fit in anywhere. And that's, I'm going to say from birth, that's probably an exaggeration, but from some, ver from a very young age, right? I was very just aware that I would go in different spaces and not fit in. Whether that's from being from a very working class background and loving books, you know, that set me apart. Whether it was how I looked racially or ethnically wherever I went, you know, I, I don't have a look that is stereotypically one way or another, according to US. And so wherever I go, most people don't know, oh, what are you and who are you with and all this kind of stuff. And so that really gave a sort of sensibility, I think, in me of not fitting in, but also I had so much confidence and positive reinforcement academically that it gave me a confidence that I think a lot of people who are from the kinds of backgrounds I'm from don't have. And so I wasn't afraid to learn stuff, to read stuff, to think stuff. And I really didn't care if other people agreed with it or not, not in a, in a way that was, you know, trying to be difficult, but I was just so curious about everything. And so I would just find random books in you know, cheap bookstores that existed when I was a little kid or in libraries whenever I could find them and learn about crazy terms, right? Like feminism, learning about the civil rights movement. You know, I was in almost 50. And so I was a little kid in the 80s and, and teenager in the 90s and just really absorbing whatever I could about ideas that weren't fleshed out the way they are now and really got to, to see all of that sort of start. So I was never thinking, oh, I can only read people who are from the same background as me, or I can only, you know, learn from people who are telling me in my family. I was like, I'll learn anything from anywhere. I don't care. We didn't have the internet back then, um, but we just read everything I could get my hands on and that informed me. And then in college, Again, I don't care if I do things differently than other people, which I think is a freedom of being a first generation college student. I didn't have like an equation that I had to follow. So I was taking all the courses I possibly could, but loved anthropology, loved sociology, loved all these things that I think really go with psychology, but that technically weren't required as a psych major and just fell in love with all these authors and theorists and everything. And that continued to inform my work even when I was only able to study psych in grad school. So people who technically aren't psychologists, but who absolutely to this day continue to inform my work. So let's get into some of the intellectual academic stuff here. Sure. Uh, let's help us define uh, a couple of terms from your experience. I, I want our listeners to, to understand, how would you define intersubjectivity? What do you yeah. mean by that? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a term that comes from psychoanalysis and comes from the relational psychoanalysts. And a lot of folks, I think stereotypically so, when they hear psychoanalysis or psychodynamic theory, they're like, oh, you can't do that with people of color. That's a really white field. That's really old. They think of Freud. Uh, they think of what's called ego psychology in a psychoanalytic way. But the relational psychoanalysts are sort of the newer relatively speaking, folks who really talk about what they call intersubjectivity, which is there's you, there's me, and then the relationship in between us is this thing that can only exist in between us, right? So mm -hmm. intersubjectivity, we're both subjectively present in this interaction if we're having an interaction, a relationship, or for any sort of way that two humans can come together. But that any time two humans come together, it is unique and special only in a way that the two of them coming together could look, right? Yeah. So I can be a therapist 
with 10 different people and have 10 different experiences, both for me as the therapist, and each one of them can have 10 different experiences of me. And we can all be authentic the whole time. It's just magic stuff happens in that space. Feminist psychologists talk about the co-construction of the relationship and all of that beautiful stuff. You know, humanistic folks talk about it in some sort of way, but it was really the relational psychoanalyst who coined this term intersubjectivity. And I love it. And I think it goes really well with intersectionality, which is a term, of course, that we have from other spaces. So I'm like, I'm all about intersubjectivity and intersectionality. Most people have no clue what I'm talking about when I say that, <laughs> but it, it really is true and really is based in some pretty amazing literature that's out there. Yeah, yeah. And of course, that makes sense with the intersectionality of different intersectional identities. That shared space can only happen in that moment, just mm -hmm. between between you and the client. Yeah, and so if we bring in a more sort of cosmic sense of things too, right? That that can be really special, really magical, really powerful. And honestly, I think doing clinical work with humans, although probably other work too, it doesn't have to be clinical, can change me for the better also. Right? So hopefully I'm working and helping the person that I'm working with. And also if I'm really open to it and I'm authentically present in that space, I'm absolutely touched in this work and challenged in this work and grow, I feel, in so many different ways every single day. And that's part of intersubjectivity too, right? That we impact each other mm -hmm. and we impact each other in very personal ways. Yeah. Rarely, yeah, you know, that's such an important point. Rarely do we consciously and deliberately think about how the interaction with our clients also change us. Oh, yeah. It's usually... Uh, I, you know, maybe this speaks to, as I'm talking about this dominant yeah. perspective, which is yeah. I'm going to deliver this treatment, apply this onto you. Right. right. There's a hierarchy in that statement yeah. as opposed to, you no, know, we have a shared space and mm -hmm. there's an interaction flowing back and forth right. and the client can also change me. It's not me right. applying something onto the client. Right. It's also not me, an expert, giving something to the client, right? To me, that's very white supremacy, culture, individualistic in its thinking, too, because it's like, okay, yes, I went to school and have a bunch of training and spent a bunch of money on all these things. Hopefully, I know a few things. And I think people come to us wanting us to know stuff and wanting us to help them. Absolutely. I'm interested in trying to be helpful. And also, I do not believe that it is helpful, no matter how smart I am, to go into space thinking, oh, I have all the answers and here I'll just apply it to you and then you'll feel better and then we're done. And to me, that's why I, I so much focus on relational theories because I feel like they're really the only ones talking about this kind of stuff. Um, do I still rely on CBT and other things that end in T for ideas and techniques? Sure, that's very helpful in a lot of ways. Very helpful with panic attacks, for example. Very helpful with certain things that we've got really clear evidence is relevant and helpful for a lot of people. But in the, the way in which I deliver that, I think is so relevant. And the relationship, of course, that we have, and we know that the common factors research tells us, right, that it's the relationship that really heals people and all that kind of stuff. But I don't think anyone's talking about the relationship enough other than the more relational theories uh, in mm. psychodynamic. If I'm wrong, please, people email me and tell me other theories that are out there because I'm always really curious as to who's thinking about this stuff and, and how do we relate with each other. Yeah, I, I was very fortunate that graduate training, we had faculty members who they were teaching object relations. So very relational. Yeah. Yeah, psychodynamic approach. Yeah. And the relational theories really started with object relations, right? And the mm -hmm. intersubjectivity folks just kind of took it, I think, in their opinion, in the natural progression of, okay, if I'm trying to relate to you as a whole human and not a partial human and all that kind of language, what does that look like? And I often use that kind of language with my clients. Mm -hmm. They're like, what the heck is a whole human? I'm like, no, it's like really seeing the whole context of the person and not treating you like a stereotype. And they're like, oh, yes. That is what I want. And yeah, that makes sense. You know, gosh, maybe this is going to start to change the way I do my work. <laughs> <laughs> kind of get back into the psychodynamic roots. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. And I don't, you know, I'm not afraid to tell people those terms. And I even use some of those terms on my website and things like that. Most people don't know what that means or care, right? Like clients just want to feel better. And I totally get that. But when people say to me, what's it like to work with you? Or even when I thought about 
what kind of information am I going to put on my websites or anything public facing about me that's sort of like a directory listing for a client or something. I really tried to make it clear that I'm relational, right? Because if someone comes to me and they just want me to give them techniques to do at home, they're not going to like me and that's okay, right? I don't have to be the perfect therapist for everybody. But if people are interested in sort of like diving into this stuff, we can do techniques, but I hope that it's in a space that feels relational and that really works well. I think not only for folks that honestly know what Latinx culture is and know how relational it is in general, at least stereotypical, stereotypically speaking, but also who I am as a person. And I'm interested in being authentic in the space. So I'm relational and that's just true. So some folks are not interested and that's okay. But for the clients who are interested in working with me, I think it works really well, especially uh, doing all the trauma work that I do. Mm -hmm. So relating to the work you're doing, the trauma work, can you tell me what you're trying to accomplish with Borderlands Therapy Collaborative? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, as you said in the intro, I worked for almost 20 years uh, in large systems and really thought in my first generation college student sort of way, right? You know, my, my grandparents and parents told me things like, get a job with good benefits and do all this kind of stuff. And I did. And, and I had these beautiful jobs in these large systems with beautiful benefits, thinking that that was going to, you know, bring fulfillment. It really didn't, especially over time, because that's when I realized that, you know, sexism is real and racism is real. And I knew that before, but I think the higher that I got up in these systems, the more I realized that they wanted me to look and act a certain way in order to remain acceptable in those spaces, right? And I am not anybody's poster child because I'm too interested in authenticity. And the last thing you want in your person talking to the newspaper or getting interviewed and representing the school or any of that kind of stuff, the last thing you want is someone who's going to answer questions honestly about suicide rates or how we respond to alcoholism or sexual assault or any of this kind of stuff, right? So the more I had tension with my supervisors who were like, yeah, no, you're doing great stuff, but like, they didn't, no one ever told me to shut up, but they were essentially telling me to shut up and, you know, stop telling people the truth essentially no one ever said it that way but that's really what i knew i was being told right like, like what were the signals you were given that yeah may have conveyed this message yeah so i i definitely was liked by my supervisors for being productive right these are all very white supremacy kinds <laughs> of terms for being productive you know i am smart my cv has certain things on it that people like in those spaces you know supervising people keeping people in line knowing ethics and law and all this kind of stuff right all of that was great but when it came time to have the shiny face and the the party line right of whatever our attorneys at the university told us to say or whatever the you know leadership would tell us to say i was always like hold on and would try to ask questions which were found to be disrespectful so i would i would be told things like you can't ask that of the president and i'd be like the president's holding a forum on alcohol use in students and i can't stand up as the director of the counseling center focused on mental health i'm not allowed to stand up and say hey great talk what are we doing about you know blah 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 binge drinking or sexual assault that happened when people are drinking or whatever and I'm like, no, you can't bring light to these things. And we don't want to look bad. And it was always, we don't want to look bad. You're talking too much. Are you trying to dominate the conversation? And I thought I was asking a question during question and answer time. And I would ask like one question with maybe a follow-up and was very confused until I realized, oh, they don't want to hear what you're saying. Or they don't want anyone to hear what you're saying. They don't want these things to be known. It's very much like, make us look good shut up and then you get promoted wow so like you're saying here you can do the work that supports the system yeah the white supremacy system but once we start to question things that don't make the system look like it's advancing or doing well yeah. then you're you're pushed aside and yeah. you mentioned it's a q a format so it's almost as though the questions are also very much filtered oh i'm yeah. sure yeah, yeah. Hmm. And I'm essentially someone with inside knowledge in that sort of space, right? And so it was like, especially I think, and this was 
you know, shocking to me only because I try to think the best of people. <laughs> but it was shocking to me how much people don't want to talk about mental health in certain systems, right? They don't want to talk about how stressed out people really are or how suicidal people are in universities, how much, you know, substance use and sexual assault and all of these things that we know are true if we have any sort of critical understanding of the issues, but that people don't want out there because they want people to keep spending their money. It's a business, right? They want people to keep coming in and spending their money and all this kind of stuff. And me, with my desire to truly help people in a real way, it's like, no, we have to talk about these things. We have to bring them out to light. That's the only way we're all gonna be able to be present and work together. And they're like, they don't wanna hear any of that, right? Mm. The, the individualism, I think too, became more and more clear to me as I got further up, right? Because when I was in counseling centers as a staff clinician, that was amazing. We're doing outreaches and we have relationships with people all over campus and all this beautiful stuff. And I felt I could be very collaborative and very collectivistic, which I realized later is, is who I am. I didn't know how relevant that was until I was in these systems. But when I was the director, when I was in these leadership meetings representing mental health spaces, right? I would be in meetings talking about budget, talking about building new buildings, talking about all this kind of stuff. And I realized, oh, they look at me to like keep the lid on stuff and, and don't let that stuff come out. If I'm doing my job well, there's no suicides or there's none of this stuff making us look bad. And I'm like, what? That is not possible ever. First, like we can't ever like, yeah, it's completely unrealistic. Do I want there to be no suicides? Of course I want that. Do I want all of these things to never happen? Of course, but that is not real life. And me being held accountable for that, and by extension, my staff being held accountable for that, it, it's just like, you're setting me up to fail, and how can I possibly do right by that if that's the expectation? Not to mention, the last thing I'm gonna do is go back to my staff and talk about this because it's so ridiculous and unrealistic. I would never put that on mental health professionals. And so I felt very much in the middle of Ugh. this unwinnable situation. Yeah, yeah, as you're describing that, it, you, you must've been very torn because oh my gosh, you know yeah. you were in many ways trying to protect your staff from some of this stuff Absolutely. while trying to be effective. And so is that, and I think this is a journey you you took because I think you you left I guess a lot of your leadership positions mm -hmm. to start Borderlands. Can you tell me more about Borderlands Therapy Collaborative? Yeah, absolutely. So I eventually realized I can't do this anymore, <laughs> that it's not why I got my doctorate in clinical psychology, right? I really believe in it. I really take this seriously. I'm not interested in, you know, the golden handcuffs, as some people would call it, because the benefits and the salary were so good. And so I was very scared about what that meant and really didn't know what to do with that feeling, right? And so I would take jobs at different universities. I was, you know, in leadership at a few, at three different universities. Um, and I was like, oh, it'll be better over here because this is different or, you know, whatever, whatever. And that might have been true for a small time, but then eventually the same feelings would come up in me, right? And it was what really- are, What are those same feelings? Yeah, so the feelings were, I, this is not why I went to school. I don't get to be honest. And for me, I feel like a wild animal in a cage if I don't get to speak authentically. Now, I can shut up if it's not the right time. I can have good timing. But if you tell me you don't get to say the truth in here, that that's not going to work well for my relationship mm -hmm. with a person or with an organization or anything like that. I want to constantly get to the root of things, which is, you know, good for a depth therapist, mm -hmm. but not good mm -hmm. for somebody who's like paid to be the face of, of certain things, right? So when I sort of was able to name that and realize that, and that took years, right, of self-reflection and journaling and therapy and all this kind of stuff. When I was able to really realize that, having to coincide with COVID and having to coincide with my partner getting a job that had, you know, beautiful health insurance for us or whatever. And so I think all of that was connected. It, it was just sort of like, I was at a point where I just couldn't take it anymore without my mental health and physical health starting to suffer that COVID opened my mind in ways that I never was open to before around virtual therapy. I knew that virtual therapy existed. I was huge against it. I was like, you can't possibly do that ethically and all this kind of stuff. Now, to be fair, 
you know, I've, I've seen it from the beginning and it has changed a lot from the beginning. I defend my, my thoughts from the way it was in the beginning, but I wasn't interested in keeping up with it. And I hadn't seen all the ways in which there were now, you know, like HIPAA encrypted level stuff out there for things that were affordable and you didn't need these giant machines like we used to have to have in hospitals and things like that. So COVID just opened my mind to what was possible. And I was still in leadership positions in counseling centers when COVID first started. So I was there writing all the policies with, you know, other folks in the center and learning how to do this. And we had to do it really fast and how to teach the staff how to do it and all that stuff. And it just like light bulbs just kind of started going off in my mind. And I had a colleague who I was working with, who I knew had her own practice on the side, which is something that people had told me to do forever. But I was like, I'm already working like 60 to 80 hours a week. There's no way, there's no way I can do that, right? I don't have emotional capacity, let alone the time or anything like that to have a practice on the side. But she was a clinician, she uh, like at the counseling center and she had a practice on the side. And she said something about it being virtual. And I was like, oh, well, you know, what's it gonna be like when you have to go back to in-person after COVID? And she said, my practice has always been virtual even before COVID. And that blew my mind. And I said, what are you talking about? And at this huh. time I was in uh, the Washington DC area. And she said, people love not having to deal with traffic, parking, they can you know, see me on their lunch hour, they can see me in the car, they can do all this stuff. And I was just like, oh my God, I had no idea that all of that was possible, right? I looked at teletherapy as like, oh, everyone's gonna go back to in-person after COVID's done. I think back then we still thought COVID was gonna be done in like two months or something. <laughs> and it, it just kept opening my mind to what was possible. And so at that same time, my partner got a job that allowed us not only benefits with their position, but also, you know, they're able to move around. Their, their boss is very supportive and they have people all over. And so they don't mind if you work from home and all this kind of stuff. And so it just opened everything up for me. And I feel like all the emotions I had been having about my career and not feeling fulfilled and really feeling like I, I used to say to my partner, I don't feel like I'm being fully utilized. I don't feel like I can really like be myself, right? And there were people who loved me and treated me very well. So it's not like nobody wanted me to be myself, but I knew I could do so much more than I was able to do in these positions. And for someone like me, I don't coast. Like I'm not interested in coasting. I'm not interested in just, you know, oh, you're getting older now. You should slow down. I'm like, no, I have more ideas. I want to do more keep stuff. Learning. And exactly. Yeah. I've always been like that and that has not changed. And so it just sort of started to make sense that I should look into doing something on my own. And so I was so scared, but I started looking into how to create my own practice, how to do a website, what are the tax implications, like all the behind the scenes stuff. I already knew how to do the clinical stuff because I had been doing that, you know, pretty much my, my whole career. Um, so I wasn't afraid of like, how do you have informed consents and what do you do clinically? I was afraid, am I gonna mess something up on a website or how do you do advertising mm -hmm. or any of that kind of stuff? So I spent, you know, about six months learning that uh, in the evenings and on weekends from, from working full time. And then just kind of took the plunge and started my own practice uh, in 2021. So I just started out solo uh, with Renaga Abiko consulting and psychological services, which I still have. And I have a number of consulting contracts under that uh, business now, but fully transitioned to Borderlands because what happened is as I had my own practice, you know, just as one person, I always knew in the back of my mind, I wanted to do something bigger. But also at that time, I was like, stop up Geneva, you're exhausted, you're burnt out, you're sick of systems, you're trying to get away from systems, you don't want to build a new system, what are you talking about? And so there was that sort of like struggle in my mind uh, for a solid two years. But I, I always knew, even when I was first starting, that I wanted to have some version of a group practice. So I would have journals and I would take notes and have ideas and flashes of images and whatever. And it was just kind of gathering all of that until I knew that I would be ready. So eventually, not because I was bored, because I've been very busy, but it just became clear to me that I needed to move forward uh, with my group practice. Um, and I kind of sort of found myself talking about it more with friends and colleagues. And I was like, okay, Geneva, that means that you want to get going and start building this thing. And so started building a website, started thinking of names and things like that. And, and I always knew that with what is now called Borderlands, I always knew that with Borderlands, I wanted to be a space 
where clinicians could work for me. I hate to say it that way, but clinicians, you know, clinicians could be part of the collaborative and feel seen as clinicians, hopefully make enough money that they don't feel burnt out or sucked dry. And burnout is a giant conversation we can have forever. But I want it to be a different space where they feel seen in all of who they are, where they can feel some version of community. So, you know, private practice can be a really lonely place if you're by yourself, especially mm-hmm. virtually, I think. And I want it to be a great space for clinicians. I also want it to be a great space for clients, right? So I landed on this term borderlands really from Gloria Anseldua's book, La, you know, Borderlands, La Frontera, I'm kind of looking at the book right now, in which she talks about this in-between space. And she's really talking about it from an ethnic space. You know, she shared a lot of her own identities, but also from what we would now call, you know, the sort of intersectionality space. She didn't use that term. That term wasn't as popular back then. This book is from the 80s. But I always loved that book. And that book had saved me. I had found it as a teenager. And I was like, of course, I have to, you know, honor the borderlands and honor all of these amazing mujeristas and Latinx folks that have influenced me in so many amazing ways. And so wanted it to be clear in the title, if people even know, you know, you never know what people think Mm -hmm. when they see words and titles and stuff. But I wanted it to be clear to folks that this is a space where if you don't fit in anywhere else, hopefully you can feel like you fit in here. That is true for clinicians. That's also true for clients. And then I would love for us to have, you know, representation in all 50 states that even though we are virtual and and I really just want to be virtual uh, for a lot of reasons, accessibility uh, being the biggest one, I want us to be everywhere so that clients from any sort of space uh, in the U.S. could receive services from us. And then, of course, I would love to have a training component that trains emerging clinicians in this kind of way, because I think that it's very, very difficult being a person of color as yeah. a trainee. Yeah, it's, seeking postdocs and internships oh in a way yeah. that resonates with, uh, with I'll say us, you know, because yeah. we're, yeah. 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 And so I think the other magnificent thing as you're describing the emergence and in creation of borderlands and thinking about systems, how you're pitted. Wait, I don't want to get back into systems. Yeah. But I think it's different because as you're describing this, I hear an intentional approach where the system that you're creating is coming from. Yeah. Uh, it's more from relational. I want to create a space to just hear and see people mm-hmm. for who they are so people can be heard. Yeah. Yeah. I don't worship money. Do I have a scarcity mentality sometimes that's very common with folks who are from where I'm from? Especially immigrant families. I definitely get scared. I think that was one of the main things holding me back from starting a practice at all was fear of not having a consistent paycheck and things like that. But I've always been very clear that I don't worship money. And when possible, and this wasn't always possible in my life, but when possible, I don't make decisions from that place, right? And so I'm incredibly fortunate, you know, with my own practice, I'm still very busy with clients. And so I, you know, don't need Borderlands to make money for me to be happy with it. I created it to be infrastructure to help folks have their practices and be able to to exist in that sort of way. And I think that that makes every difference in the world when we're talking about philosophy and goals. And, you know, I decided uh, to have clinicians as 1099, you know, independent contractors, as opposed to W2 employees, because I wanted them to have the most freedom possible. I want someone to work with me if they've got four hours a week to offer. I want someone to work with Borderlands if they want it to be their full-time gig, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, to be, you know, they charge whatever fees they want. They work whatever hours they want. And that is really important to me, that sort of freedom, because I don't pretend to know what someone's situation Mm -hmm. is. And are you recruiting? Absolutely. Okay. Okay. That's good to know. I will include that on the show notes. Now, I want to shift gears here in our conversation. So for folks, and I think this is something based on your experience and training, for folks who are doing relational work, Mm -hmm. and as you had mentioned, oh, you know, psychodynamic is very white in a way, but you in many ways have found a way to challenge that perspective. Mm -hmm. What are some important distinctions, adaptations, or considerations that 
clinicians should consider when they're using this theoretical model yeah. and working with clients of color? Yeah, I actually don't think of it as adaptation because if you know psychoanalysis from a critical lens, Freud himself was incredibly revolutionary. He tends to be mistranslated a lot, but he was all about freedom. He was all about if you actually, like the goal of, he didn't call it therapy at the time, but like the goal of this stuff is for you to be free. And no one, you know, that didn't make it into the Cliff Notes version that a lot of people, you know, learn about Freud and stuff like that. Mm. And I'm not defending him. There was a lot of stuff that was problematic about Freud. However, from a revolutionary perspective and from a think outside the box perspective, he was all about that stuff, right? Freud would say things like everyone is bisexual and there's a whole bunch of theory behind that, but it's like, no one ever talks about that. Why don't we have that conversation? Oh. And why, why don't huh. people know that, right? And so I don't look at it as adaptation. I look at it as really sort of getting back to the spirit that was always there in psychoanalysis. And does that mean that all psychoanalysts practice this way? No, right? Like white supremacy is so good at taking over in systems, right? And mm -hmm. so of course it's taken over and it's been in all these places, but there have been people throughout history and there are more and more groups now who are like, no, let's bring this stuff back. Let's really do more scholarship either as psychoanalysts of color or gay psychoanalysts. And that's a giant umbrella term. There's a lot of different ways, right, that we can be not heterosexual in the work and show up and, and really do a lot of stuff. Let's not be sexist. Let's not have all this stuff. And there have been theorists throughout time in, in psychoanalysis who have been doing this. And there's more and more trying to bring that to the surface and also create new stuff. So I'm really excited at how, you know, at least the circles that I hang out in, there's a lot of energy around this and, and trying to just show, we don't have to adapt anything. We have to see what's out there, continue to see things that are possible and, and create from that perspective, because who is better suited to really know you than someone who's interested in the relationship? If I'm really willing to work on my own stuff and I'm encouraging you as the client to do the same, then we don't need to adapt anything. We just need to be honest with ourselves, right? And people talk about, oh, how do you bring in social justice elements? And how do you talk about white supremacy? It's like, it's around us all the time. If we are honest and I know my stuff and what's really going on in the world and the client brings in their stuff and they're honest, this stuff is in the room. We just need to not be afraid to talk about it, right? Hmm. And so hmm. I don't, I don't have white guilt. I'm not white. <laughs> you know, I don't, I have white colleagues who describe this feeling and I read about white fragility and I read about white guilt and all this stuff. And those concepts are very foreign to me as an individual. I don't feel that, right? So I don't have this fear of going there that I think a lot of white people have, or I read that a lot of white people have. And if I'm comfortable with it and I'm confident and I'm competent, hopefully it shows itself in the room, I think in all kinds of ways, including with this kind of stuff. But I don't look at it as adaptation. I look at it as being authentic mm -hmm. um, and, and doing what relational psychoanalytic people have been telling us all along, which is be authentic even as the provider, right? And that can really bring a lot into the space. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing that perspective and idea. And it sounds like one of it is, you know, to be truly honest with ourselves, we do have to, in many ways, do this work and question the, I mean, how am I presenting to my client? Am I being yeah. genuine? What does genuine look like? Is this image that I'm showing up with my client in this therapy room a product of, say, racist systems? Yeah. Am I willing to look at that? So as a person of color, what yeah. were some of the challenges that you faced and overcame that yeah. you would be willing to share? Yeah. I mean, you know, things I didn't realize at the time when I was young, just getting to college is a big deal. I didn't ever question that because I was always just so thirsty for knowledge that no one could stop me. But when I got to grad school, especially at the doctorate level, I really loved my professors, but I didn't have a Latinx professor at all. We had one adjunct my last year in doctoral training. And I went to school in Los Angeles, okay? People are like, oh, did you go? And no, I went to school in LA. I started my doctoral degree in the year 2000 
it really wasn't that long ago, right? Like this is crazy to think that that is the case. Now, my school now has a lot more and, you know, I know they were trying, but I was really fortunate in getting mentors that didn't look like me. And I didn't care if they looked like me. I cared that they would be supportive and all that kind of stuff, right? But when I was done and out in the world working, I was like, oh my gosh, I've never had a mentor who looked like me. I was able to get that from other organizations that I would find and build communities slowly, but surely. But I realize now what a challenge that was. And I realize now how different it would have been if I had, you know, mentors who really looked like me or who were trying to do the kind of stuff I was trying to do. I had people who were supportive of multiculturalism and, and an amazing mentor, Dr. Dale Rowe, who's African-American, who has done amazing stuff with his career and was so good to me and all that kind of stuff. But it's like, I'm lucky that he was willing to mentor me, you know, even though I'm not black and he would never, I mean, that was not even a question for him, but I'm like, wow, what would it have been like for me to see my identities out there yeah. in mentors and supervisors, right? I have only ever had white supervisors in my entire training and career with one exception where I had a supervisor uh, who was half white and half Japanese, mm -hmm. my entire career. And that is ridiculous, right? It, it probably would have been really different. And I'm not upset about where my career has taken me. I'm very excited and happy with my career, but I'm sure it would have looked different if there were people like, you know, trying to guide me, helping pave the way kind of thing. So any final thoughts? I do think that my go-getterness, I don't know how to say that any other way, uh -huh. is absolutely relevant to what my life and career has looked like. And I don't think that's okay, right? I think that, that that works really well with white supremacy culture, this whole like, you know, just make it happen and some version of the American dream kind of stuff. And I wasn't operating from those spaces. That really is how my personality is. But I think that's a problem because what if I didn't have that personality, right? What if I needed more people to sort of like help me and me believe I could do it and all that kind of stuff? then those are the folks that get lost in the cracks and who fall through the cracks, whatever the saying is in English. And I don't think that's okay. And I really hope that we can have representation in all sorts of ways, right? Including different personalities that you don't have to be this only one way in order to be able to be successful in what is still a very, I think, white supremacy culture kind of field and world, right? And, you know, or, or at least country, I can speak for the U.S. for sure that it's very much that way. But psych is that way. And I think, you know, dominant U.S. culture is that way too. And that's a problem because not everybody is like that. And that I really think that should be okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Dr. Geneva, thank you very much for sharing your insight and perspective here. Thank you so much for creating this. I'm so excited with everything that you're trying to do and for having this podcast and continuing education piece. I just, I'm really excited for all of that. You bet, you bet. Well, again, thank you very much for your time. Absolutely, thank you. I hope you liked this episode. Please subscribe and share. We love to hear from you. So send me a message on LinkedIn or email. The People of Color and Psychology is brought to you by the Multicultural Counseling Institute, and I'm your host, Jack Sun.